cyclic electron flow is different from linear electron flow. So in cyclic electron flow, uh, we don't have enough energy. The photosystem doesn't produce enough energy to excite the electrons to the state where they can be added to NADP plus to form NADPH. Uh, we don't have the energy to split water, to rip the electrons away from water. What we do have is the energy to produce ATP. So in cyclic electron flow, we have photosystem one with P700 here in the middle, uh, and the electrons can be accepted by a primary acceptor. They are transferred to ferrodoxin just like they are in linear electron flow, which is, this is the grayed out here is the linear electron flow. Ferrodoxin can dump those electrons into the cytochrome complex where they can uh, produce ATP through ATP synthase. The electrons can get passed on to plastocyanin and they can be cycled back to P700 with another photon of 700 nanometers. So we get ATP, uh, we produce a lot of energy which enables us to uh, f fuel photosynthesis, um, but we don't get a lot of those other benefits. We don't get NADPH, we don't get oxygen. <clears throat> so Chloroplasts and mitochondria, as we've said a couple of times now, were, are, are very similar. We think that they were both once free-living prokaryotes before they were consumed by an early eukaryotic cell. Uh, and they have their own DNA, they have their own ribosomes, they have uh, membranes that other uh, organelles do not. They both use ATP synthase to produce ATP, and they do it by using those very highly convoluted membranes to sequester uh, protons. So they keep protons penned up by using electron energy and to drive ATP synthase. So mitochondria uh, is transferring chemical energy from glucose or food molecules to produce ATP. Chloroplasts are using that light energy to produce ATP. Uh, in both, we have an electron transport chain which is pumping protons somewhere. In the case of the mitochondrion, it's going into the intermembrane space. So in here we've got uh, higher concentration of protons, lower pH, more acidic. In the case of chloroplasts, the pH is lower, the, the proton concentration is higher inside the lumen of the thylakoid, inside the, the thylakoid space. So in the case of chloroplasts, when they produce ATP via photophosphorylation, ramming phosphate uh, functional groups onto ADP, they are also releasing protons into the stroma, which are going to get pumped back into the lumen of the thylakoids through the electron transport chain using those excited electrons. Uh, excite, what excited them? The sun excited them. So this picture showing a thylakoid shows how that system works. And you can see it looks an awful lot like what's happening within the Christi of the mitochondrion. You've got these multi-protein complexes uh, that are passing electrons along uh, and using them to pump protons. And those protons uh, would generate a gradient which drives ATP synthase, which produces ATP. Only in this case, we get to keep using those electrons. Uh, we don't have a terminal electron acceptor. Our electron acceptor is NADP plus, uh, and those electrons still have a lot of energy. 
In fact, they have more energy. The, the electrons in NADPH have more potential energy than the electrons that uh, we pull off of glucose in respiration. Right? And that makes sense because we know from the second law of thermodynamics, uh, we can't break even. We can't get more energy uh, from the breaking down of glucose than we get from the production of glucose. All right, think on that for a second. So anyway, uh, this is all is very similar, very analogous to what's happening in the mitochondria, and only it's happening in the thylakoids in chloroplasts. Next thing we need to do is take all that reducing power, take that ATP, and channel it to the Calvin cycle so we can fix some carbon. Here's a question for you. If a plant is sad, do the other plants photosympathize with it? Wah, wah. Okay, so the Calvin cycle. Uh, as if it wasn't enough of a uh, amazing feat that sunlight is powerful enough to oxidize oxygen, we're going to take carbon dioxide, which you recall is a very oxidized form of carbon, and we're going to channel that energy back into, uh, into the carbon dioxide. We're going to reduce that carbon and make sugar. So the Calvin cycle, like the citric acid cycle, regenerates the starting material. Whoa. Uh, so we bring in some new molecules, uh, but we keep regenerating uh, the molecules that are within the cycle. So we're going to build sugar from smaller molecules. So we're building up. We need to add some energy. We have phosphorylation through ATP as a way of doing that, and we have some very potent electrons coming to us from NADPH. So carbon, in the form of carbon dioxide, is going to enter, and then the sugar we get directly from the Calvin cycle is not, is not glucose. Uh, the sugar that we get from the Calvin cycle is glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate, or G3P. And you might say to yourself, that sounds familiar. Where have I heard of this strange molecule before, this glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate? We saw it in uh, glycolysis. After the energy investment phase, one of the three carbon molecules we get is glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate. And we know that it's not so many steps removed to take glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate to glucose. So plants actually produce uh, G3P directly and then can convert that into glucose. But the thing that comes right out of the Calvin cycle is not glucose, it is G3P. So in order to produce one molecule of G3P, uh, the cycle has to take place three times, right? Because G3P has three carbons in it which means we need to add in three molecules of CO2 to get those three carbon atoms. Uh, coincidentally, the Calvin cycle, uh, we typically can break it down into three phases. Uh, carbon fixation, adding carbon dioxide to organic molecules. Reduction, so we take the carbon dioxide uh, and we can reduce that carbon, have it give it a little more electron density, give it a little more potential energy, and then we have to regenerate our carbon dioxide acceptor, which is a uh, molecule called uh, ribulose bisphosphate, or RUBP. So carbon fixation is catalyzed by an enzyme that's thought to be the most abundant enzyme on the planet called Rubisco. Uh, and it's uh, what that is. Well, I'm not going to tell you that right now. Yeah, I'll tell you that right now. Uh, Rubisco is a shortening of the full name of the enzyme, which is ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. Isn't that a mouthful? 
So fortunately we have this name Rubisco, which whenever I say Rubisco, it makes me think of Nabisco, which is a company that makes cookies and crackers. Uh, Rubisco is an enzyme that adds carbon dioxide to organic molecules. And do you need to remember this big fancy long name? Eh, you might come to uh, remember it once you realize all the things that Rubisco can do. So remember it's got this ASE ending, suggesting it's doing something with carboxyls. Substrates can be carboxyl groups, but it can also work on oxygen, oxygenase. So it actually has two functions, and we're going to discuss both of those functions. Uh, a good function and a not so good function. So the Calvin cycle is taking carbon dioxide from the air, it's taking uh, that reducing power from NADPH, the fancy electron bus, uh, it's taking the power of phosphorylation in ATP and producing sugar. So we get ADP back, we get NADP plus back, uh, and we get sugar out. All right, so let's go through these three steps one at a time. Uh, we're going to add a molecule of carbon dioxide uh, one time per cycle, three for a total to get in order to get a, a 3PG, a G3P out. So carbon fixation, we're going to take carbon dioxide, we're going to mash it onto this 5-carbon compound, which is called ribulose bisphosphate. Uh, ribulose bisphosphate, we mash a carbon dioxide molecule onto it, and we get this very unstable intermediate. This thing can't exist for very long, so it breaks down into uh, a three carbon, two three carbon molecules called three phosphoglycerate. Okay, uh, and I'm going to try and make things explain how these uh, these uh, coefficients work. So we've got three here. So we've got these three carbon dioxide molecules entering, forming. <coughs> three molecules of um, being combined with three molecules of ribulose bisphosphate or RUBP. Uh, those are going to break down into six molecules of three phosphoglycerate. Okay, so we had three of these five carbon molecules plus three of these one carbon molecules are going to form three of these six carbon molecules. The six carbon molecule is very unstable, so it breaks down into six three-carbon molecules. So if you got all the accounting clear there, I hope so. So those six three-carbon molecules are going to absorb, uh, they're going to get phosphorylated, give them more potential energy. So we go from three phosphoglycerate to one three bisphosphoglycerate. Now it's got phosphorus at both ends, phosphate groups at both ends. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to reduce our 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. We're going to absorb electrons from NADPH. We're going to lose some of those phosphate groups to get six molecules of G3P, which is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So we have reduced the carbon in 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So now these molecules have more potential energy, and one of those G3 molecules can leave the cycle, which is going to leave us with five molecules of G3P, and we have to get back to ribulose bisphosphate. We have to regenerate ribulose bisphosphate. How do we do that? Well, we lost one of our G3Ps, so we have six, go from having six uh, three carbon molecules to having five three uh, carbon molecules. So three times five is 15. We've got 15 carbon atoms, which we can rearrange, 
a little bit of phosphorylation power to form three five carbon molecules. So five three carbon molecules, alakazam, ATP hydrolysis, we get three five carbon molecules, which is ribulose bisphosphate. Okay, so we are back to the, uh, the carbon dioxide acceptor, which is ribulose bisphosphate. All right, so a little bit more complicated than what we saw in uh, previous steps, which is why we talked about cellular respiration first, and then we get to the Calvin cycle. This is, uh, we don't even talk about what are the enzymes here. Uh, we do talk about inputs and outputs. What do you need to know? Well, you definitely need to know these three different phases. You need to know uh, what Rubisco is doing. Rubisco is adding the carbon onto uh, this ribulose bisphosphate. Uh, where, what are we doing? We're using ATP and NADPH to reduce the carbon to make G3P, not glucose, not directly. G3P can be easily converted to glucose and other compounds. Uh, but the direct output is G3P. Okay.